First, I'd like to thank the organizers. <clears throat> My voice is a little rough today, so you'll have to kind of bear with me. But um, thank the organizers. It's a, a pleasure for me to um, address this particular audience because my focus has been on thyroid hormone and brain development and trying to make our research work relevant to kind of a clinical setting. So what I'm going to do because I'm beginning this uh, symposium is really give you kind of a broad stroke perspective of the concept of endocrine disruptors um, and a little bit of data from my lab that gives you some concept about sort of what we're up against. First, I'd like to state that I have no, uh, no conflicts to disclose here. So first of all, this concept of endocrine disruption really became popular by this 1996 book, Our Stolen Future. Uh, and this book really set off, it came at a good time historically because Congress was enacting some legislation that was relevant to this issue. Um, and as a result, a number of organizations have defined what an endocrine disruptor is. The World Health Organization in 2002 <coughs> described or defined an endocrine disruptor <coughs> as um, exogenous substance or mixture that alters functions of the endocrine system and consequently causes adverse health effects. And the endocrine society sort of refined this by saying that an endocrine disruptor is a chemical or mixture that interferes with hormone action. And by action, what we really mean is um, hormone regulation of receptors that mediate downstream effects. Now, we don't have the term adverse effects in there for a lot of reasons. One, for my personal thinking, is that if you interfere, for example, with thyroid hormone action during brain development, it's hard to imagine that anything good is going to come from that. <clears throat> so with that in mind, um, I worked with a group of uh, a number of other authors international experts in this field to publish a um, kind of state-of-the-art of endocrine disrupting chemicals in 2012 and this was sponsored by the UN Environmental Program and the World Health Organization. Um, this is really a compendium of, of research that is relevant to this issue at least up to that time. So one of the things I want to do is give you an idea now of how chemicals are being evaluated for hormone action. This is the US EPA's Endocrine Disruptors Screening Program. And what you can see here is that there are a number of in vitro assays and in vivo assays. There's some, there's a fish assay, an amphibian metamorphosis assay, which is relevant to thyroid but from a thyroid perspective, there's really not much here except for hormone levels and thyroid weight and possibly histopathology in the, these two male and female pubertal assays. So there's no developmental um, kind of endpoints related to thyroid hormone action. And in fact, there's nothing even, rel even similar to uterotrophic, which is uterine weight or this Hirschberger assay, which is prostate weight that kind of <clears throat> evaluates estrogen and androgen action. Um, so this is, this is, I think, the best they could do. First of all, the statute, the 1976 statute that they have to abide by, I think is a weak law. Everybody realizes that. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't allow most chemicals to be evaluated for safety, and I think EPA is probably doing the best that they can do. So right now what I'm going to do is talk about thyroid disruption. I'm going to spin through this pretty quickly. Um, first of all, just to set the stage, in 1989 there was a group that showed clearly that thyroid hormone could be passed from the mother to the fetus, uh, and the, the placenta didn't destroy all that thyroid hormone, so it didn't act as a barrier to thyroid hormone. Then in the late 90s, 
a group showed that maternal thyroid hormone levels during pregnancy, when insufficient, was correlated with cognitive deficits in <clears throat> the offspring. So these are two very important concepts because the fetus doesn't begin to make thyroid hormone until, in fact, second trimester. And, and anything that happens to the mother to decrease thyroid hormone or thyroid hormone transport could potentially affect the fetus. Um, Joanne Rovet also has done, has really spent a career producing very good work on um, congenital hypothyroidism, and she's recently published some preliminary findings showing that uh, maternal hypothyroidism might contribute to abnormal cortical morphology. Our basic work in the lab is related <clears throat> to fetal cortical um, development and thyroid hormone. <laughs> so this was of interest to us. So these studies that were designed to develop the optimal treatment strategies for children with congenital hypothyroidism demonstrated that timing and dose of T4 replacement are important and that the neonatal brain <clears throat> is quite a bit more sensitive than we might have thought back certainly in the 70s or 80s or 90s. Um, so I think that these are important, this is important background information that you have to interpret uh, some of the basic science work that I'm gonna show. So the logic here is that chemical interference with thyroid hormone action or thyroid function in the mother could produce neurodevelopmental deficits. Now, what I'm gonna do is focus on PCBs. This is, the, this is just the structure of thyroxin. PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, have a structure that's very similar, but there are also a number of chemicals to which we are all exposed that also have this kind of biphenolic, in some cases, um, diphenyl ethers, such as these polybrominated diphenyl ethers that are used as flame retardants. This is an antibacterial agent that's also a chlorinated diphenyl ether. Bisphenol A itself has a structure that fits within the binding site of uh, the thyroid hormone receptor. There's a number of studies that indicate that uh, bisphenol A is an indirect antagonist on at least the beta receptor. So what I'm gonna do to start with is that a large number of studies, of large cohort studies, have shown that fetal PCB exposure is associated with cognitive deficits, and you don't have to look through all these um, these specific issues, whoops, I didn't intend to do this. The main point here is that in all these studies, there's a downward arrow indicating that there are cognitive deficits. Those specific deficits are different from one study to another for a variety of reasons, but one of the things that I always <coughs> like to point out is that the effect of thyroid hormone insufficiency itself uh, the specific effect is dependent upon the timing of exposure, that window of thyroid hormone deficiency or insufficiency. So it's not unreasonable to think that, that all cohort studies won't produce the same or won't exhibit the same kind of effect um, as other studies. So to, I'm trying to make a long story short here. One of the things that we found both in vitro and in animals is that chemicals that induce the expression of an enzyme, this is CYP1A1, this enzyme can hydroxylate some individual PCBs but also other kinds of compounds. And we know that at least some of these PCBs can bind to the thyroid hormone and increase the expression or decrease the expression depending on the, essentially the thyroid response element uh, kind of downstream. Now, one of the things that's important here is that this can happen in tissues without changing hormone levels in the blood. And that's really gonna be the, the big take home lesson for me today is that thyroid hormone levels in the blood don't always map to thyroid uh, to interference with thyroid hormone action in specific tissues. And we've shown this 
pretty clearly in animals, but I think it's important to bring this to humans. And one of the issues here is we've got to have some kind of tissue that exhibits these characteristics. And it turns out placenta is a good tissue to focus on because, first of all, you can, you can obtain uh, placentas it also has inducible CYP1A1, and there are well-known thyroid hormone response genes in placenta. So what we did, what I did was to collaborate with a group in Canada, Larissa Taxer's group in Sherbr at the University of Sherbrooke, to evaluate placentas. I think we had 164 placentas from a cohort study that she had established. The first thing we find is that smoking increases CYP1A1 expression. Other people have shown this. You can show this in vitro as well. Um, so we've got a tissue that has a very broad expression, level of expression of CYP1A1 in this tissue. We find a very strong correlation <clears throat> between CYP1A1 expression and two different thyroid hormone response genes. This is placental lactogen, this is growth hormone variant. These two genes themselves are also tightly correlated with each other, suggesting a, a third or an independent regulator. What we're kind of proposing here, and I'll show you some data that support this a little bit better because I can think of a number of reasons. In fact, when we did this experiment, it probably took us, we, we actually, took these measurements first, and because they looked so good, my conclusion was something has to be wrong. So we probably spent two years trying to chase down what could be throwing us off, and we've, we've basically failed to identify any reason not to believe that these are um, truly correlated. Now, we think that what that means is that CYP1A1 is an enzyme that bioactivating some chemicals, whether it's PCBs or other kinds of chemicals, we're not sure. That's something that, that we need to follow up on. We, there were about 32 placentas that had no detectable CYP1A1, and I think this is where it gets interesting because these two thyroid hormone response genes exhibit a correlation, although weak, with cord blood T4, suggesting that cord blood T4 is regulating the expression of these genes. We saw no correlation in those placentas that had measurable CYP1A1. Uh, at the same time, you can see that these two genes, even in placentas that had no measurable CYP1A1, are also very tightly regulated. So one interpretation of this is that for those people that are exposed to chemicals that induce the expression of CYP1A1, there's bioactivation of molecules that can <clears throat> interact with the thyroid hormone receptor and drive the expression of these genes. In the absence of that, or when uh, CYP1A1 is not expressed, you see a normal correlation between, um, between thyroid hormone itself in, in cord blood and the expression of these two genes. So what we're proposing is this kind of two-step mechanism that in fact the placenta in, an, in what might be teleologically an attempt to uh, detoxify chemicals that are coming into the placenta instead are bioactivating some of those chemicals which then interfere with thyroid hormone action. We can show in vitro that the same chemical can act as a, a direct agonist or a direct antagonist depending on the nature of the thyroid hormone response element. So these are just the data that I'm showing here are kind of proof of purpose um, or of uh, of concept, but also it's, it's important to recognize that thyroid hormone levels in the mother weren't altered. And so there is this concern, and I think concern with evidence, that both in animals and in humans, that thyroid hormone levels in the blood are not, don't faithfully represent all known mechanisms of thyroid hormone interference. Um, 
Also, it's important to recognize how much we are exposed to these kinds of chemicals. One study looked for over 400 different industrial chemicals in cord blood and found on average over 100 unique chemical signatures in each one of these cord blood samples. And I think maybe 40 or so were chemicals in common among all the different samples. So, so we certainly have large exposures. Um, and we can also show both in vitro and circumstantial evidence in humans that these chemicals can interfere with hormone action uh, at a time during development when we really can't afford it. Two other points I want to make here is this is a completely separate experiment in animals. What we're doing here is, is comparing the effect of propylthiouracil. If you use different concentrations of PTU, you see a predicted decrease in serum T4 and we replicated that with polybrominated diphenyl ethers. Okay, so we brought thyroid hormone levels in the pups to the same place that we're bringing thyroid hormone level with PTU. However, you see an increase in TSH in those animals where the thyroperoxidase enzyme was inhibited, but you don't see that with this with polybrominated diphenyl ethers. Now, the concept is that, that PBDEs are acting like um, some drugs that activate the liver and increase serum thyroid hormone clearance, um, like phenobarbital. But phenobarbital also increases serum TSH. So we're really not sure what's happening here. But what we do see in the liver of these pups is that PTU causes a decrease in the expression of the thyroid hormone response genes, in this case, malic enzyme, but you see the opposite in the animals treated with polybrominated diphenyl ethers. So in this case, thyroid hormone levels are declining, but the impact downstream is exactly the opposite of what you would predict. We've looked at a number of other genes. They don't all follow that pattern, but they don't follow the pattern. None of these genes follows the pattern of what happens with PTU. So PTU gives us this kind of idealized model of how the thyroid hormone system is working, but it doesn't seem to apply in other kinds of situations, and I think that this is going to be an important issue. So chemicals can have adverse effects on development by interfering with hormone actions in ways that are not predicted by these idealized models. And I think this is true both for thyroid hormone, for estrogen, androgen, glucocorticoids, et cetera. I think that, that these imperfect ligands are interfering with endocrine systems in ways that, first of all, we don't fully understand, but we also don't fully understand how the endocrine system is working because we've used specific models to help us understand, for example, PTU or methimazole for the thyroid. It's a single way of manipulating the thyroid system, and we have these concepts in our mind about how they work um, that are not, I think, fully uh, vetted by other kinds of situations. So the key concerns from this UNEP WHO report of 2012, and I have the website down here on the bottom. You can pick this um, document up for free, so it's on the WHO website. It's important to recognize that there are global concerns about EDC because of the increased incidence of chronic diseases that are related to the endocrine system. Also, some some. A group of people have also tried to estimate the economic impact that chemicals are having, while nobody is suggesting that chemicals uh, are the only causative agent for some of these situations, certainly they seem to be contributing. So in terms of what we can do, first of all, te testing methods have to be improved. Um, we have to change the paradigm also of exposing humans to chemicals before adequate testing or even before any testing. Within this context, 
this concept of green chemistry where you test the, the I don't want to say safety because that's, that's actually a difficult thing to prove, but at least to show that chemicals are safer before they go onto the market. I think there are about 80,000 chemicals, an estimated 80,000 chemicals in the U.S., 140,000 globally that are in commerce. We need, we need to get kind of a handle on that. And I think that there's some good information, good approaches that some governments are taking at this moment to try to get a handle on that. But increased awareness, I think, is going to be important. So I'd like to end by, first of all, thanking the organizers. I'm not going to talk about all the students and postdocs and collaborators other than Larissa, who was responsible for this cohort study. Also funding from the NIEHS, from EPA, and from NSF. Thank you. So our, our next presenter is Frank Biro. He's uh, a long-term friend of mine, uh, like 30 plus years. Used to be my neighbor. Uh, he's a MedPeds uh, trained uh, 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 pediatrician. I guess he's a pediatrician. He's MedPeds. Uh, but he did his fellowship at uh, Boston Children's. Uh, he ultimately saw the light and came to Cincinnati. He was our, inter our uh, division director in adolescent medicine for a number of years. What he's doing now is actually a long-term study that most of his career has actually been involved with looking at puberty development and now is very interested in puberty development and how it relates to timing and the development of breast cancer. And he's going to tell you a little bit, hopefully, about a program that he's working on now. Frank. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation and also for the opportunity for a simple country doc to present with a really stellar group of uh, presenters. So as we've already alluded to, uh, there are over 100,000 chemical compounds in the United States, 2,000 being added every year. And some of these are being produced at a really high volume, that is greater than a million tons every year. 90% of these chemicals have not been tested. And as was pointed out, Typically, when we do the testing, it's only with a single chemical, not mixtures. And again, um, Dr. Zeller uh, talked about Andreas Kortenkamp, and he used 11 different chemicals, all below the no observed effect concentration. And he put it into a yeast receptor system, and what he found was a, a very potent estrogen effect in that system. And some of those chemicals are estrogen antagonists. Virtually all Americans have measurable levels of the chemicals that I'm going to be discussing uh, during the rest of my presentation. Last year, JCM talked about the impact of VDCs and looking at probable causation, that is, assigning a probability to whether or not these were related to the outcomes, um, said that there was a probable association with IQ loss, intellectual disability, <laughs> with autism and ADHD, and Dr. Eskenazi will be discussing this in greater detail. Uh, with childhood obesity and adult obesity and type 2 diabetes, with cryptorganism and male infertility, and I have a slide about that. And when they incorporated both the probability of causation um, uh, with the economic cost, they said that the median cost was $210 billion a year. So there's a huge economic cost. So um, Dr. Zoller again gave a definition of what EDCs are. And I'm going to be talking about several different classes. This, these are clearly not an all-inclusive exhaustive list. But some of these include phenols, such as BPA. And you have to remember that the phytoestrogens are polyphenols. Phthalates, such as DEHP, my favorite perfluorochemical, PFOA. In PFOA, we found one of the groups that we had recruited into our study, one community. All the girls in the community had levels at or above the 95th percentile level for PFOA. The organohalogens, and it's true, DDE is no longer produced in the United States and uh, most Western nations, but it's still used where there's a high rate of malaria. The PCBs, which have been banned, but they're still around thanks to some of their additional uses. The PPDEs, and these are the polybrominated flame retardants. Uh, in California, there was a law that any toddler or younger had to have everything made out of uh, flame retardant chemicals. And that in your sofas that have foam, 
those are filled with PBDEs. So there's still chemicals that you're being exposed to, even though that they're banned. And another group, a fascinating group called the organic tins, Bruce Blumberg uh, noted that the, this group were some of the most potent obesogens, that is, uh, poisoning the uh, fat cell. The proposed mechanism, and so when we start this study, the observation was that most EDCs somehow binded to the receptor and either were an agonist or a very weak agonist and acting as an antagonist. But in the intervening 15 years, we know now that these EDCs can alter the number of hormone receptors. Uh, again, they can act as obesogens and diabetogens, um, and that they can promote epigenetic changes. With the EDCs, most of these changes appear to be methylations, and that they can alter the germline. And uh, Dr. Gray is going to be talking about the developmental onset of adult disorders. And some of this persistent of what happens in utero is probably through these epigenetic changes. The timing of these exposures are critical. So that agent reported that uh, when you fed newborns, formulas made with soy, that it led to a younger age of menarche, whereas our study and Cheng reported that phytoestrogen exposure uh, during childhood led to a delay in the onset of breast development. There have been lots of studies that have linked exposures in utero, in childhood, and in adolescence with later cancer, including maternal DDT, maternal use of DES, um, with boys who are chimney sweeps with scrotal cancer later in life, and DDT levels during teens and with breast cancer later in life. The top half of this slide was produced by uh, some friends of mine, um, including Jose Russo, um, and Sue Fenton, and they actually did this top part independent of each other. And so if you think about it, uh, at birth there's the outgrowth of the breast bud. And in the first six months of life, there's an involution of the tissue as all the hormonal support uh, dwindles down. With the onset of puberty, you have this proliferation and differentiation of tissues at an incredibly high level, so that you go from a gram or less of tissue to several kilograms of tissue during puberty. There's ductal outgrowth in the formation of terminal end buds, and it's only with the first full-term pregnancy that you have the formation of type 3 and type 4 lobules. And this is the breast structure that is going to be much more resistant to the effects of external chemicals. So that's what's happening on the top of the pond. Beneath the pond, you can see the duck furiously rotating its feet with, in birth, the activation of the HPO axis. That is, that full-term infants, boys and girls, have a functioning HPO, HPG axis. Uh, it becomes inactive in the first six months of life. Uh, around ages four, five, six, there's adrenarche, and subsequently the reactivation of the uh, HPO axis. And peak height velocity, and followed six to nine months later by menarche, and you know, we know that the age of menarche is related to risk of breast cancer. Um, and a study by Algren suggests that when you insert peak height velocity into um, that dynamic, that the age of menarche no longer is significant. And it doesn't make sense that somehow influencing one year of age of menarche should influence the risk of breast cancer by up to 9%. So there's probably a non another underlying biologic etiology, and I would propose that is doing with uh, peak height velocity. Girls who are born, who mature earlier, also have an earlier age of menarche, but they have a much greater peak height velocity. At the same time all this is happening, we also have the peak bone uh, mineral accrual, and that there's several studies that show that women with higher bone density have a higher risk of breast cancer. We thought it was lifelong estrogen exposure, <coughs> Again, I would say that it's probably related to other biologic phenomenon. Our project, Dr. Hybe said he hoped, and unfortunately you'll get more than perhaps you wanted, is uh, these are the three studies in our project. Mount Sinai with Mary Wolf as the PI. They recruited girls six to eight years of age and saw them annually. KPNC, Larry Cushy was the PI. They also recruited girls six to eight and saw them annually. And in Cincinnati, uh, we recruited girls in the greater Cincinnati area through schools and through the breast cancer registry of greater Cincinnati. 
We saw the girls a little bit younger at six and seven, and we saw them every six months because we wanted to capture some of these subtle changes that occurred in early puberty. Um, here's one of the money slides. And so this is the curve from, that was published in 1997 by Marsha Herman Giddens about the age of onset of breast development. And when it came out in 97, people believed that it couldn't be that early. There's been several studies that have uh, shown that her data were correct. And what I would like to draw your attention to, I'm colorblind, so I have to go by the shape of the lines. This is our group overall. Um, but you know, we're on the other side of the obesity epidemic from Marsha's study. And so she kindly lent me her raw data, and we then normalized the girls for the same BMI as in the PRO study. And this is the curve that's generated by that. And this is still, if you look at the, at the median onset, you can still see that it's younger by seven or eight months. And we believe that this is the effect of some endocrine disrupting chemicals that have entered into the environment. By the way, this is the other girls. This is about 25, 30% of our cohort. And you can see that among the overweight and obese girls, puberty is much earlier. And I'm gonna show you and propose a mechanism that has everything to do with EDCs. Um, so when you're looking at the girls, who were at or below the median BMI, you see a very robust increase in the estradiol levels, the, what you would expect as they go through puberty. This is months relative to breast development. But you see among the obese girls that there's a very blended serum estradiol response. I would propose a couple different mechanisms here. One is the effect of endocrine disrupting chemicals acting as obesogens and leading to an upregulation of tissue level aromatase, and two, that the same reason that obese postmenopausal women have higher rates of breast cancer may be the same reason why these girls are going into puberty earlier, that they're converting the adrenal androgens peripherally into estrogens and stimulating the growth plate and growth of breast tissue. So uh, I'm now going to turn to the results of our biomarkers, looking at both the urine and the serum. Um, we looked at 22 different compounds in a baseline analysis of the three Ps, phthalates, phenols, and phytoestrogens. We were above the, a level of detection for all compounds in greater than 94% of the specimens. There was a wide variability by site. For example, PDEEs were much higher in California where every kid was exposed to flame retardants by age, by race, and by season. For example, BP3, the main component in sunscreen, was much higher, of course, in the summer months. We also had bloods collected in Cincinnati and Northern California that I'll also be reporting on. So compared to the lowest intake group, those who had the highest consumption of flavanols, one of the phytoestrogens, had a later age of breast development. This was the study I hinted to earlier by Mervish. And the effect size was about five months. So Again, although we're looking at flavanol and there could be some collinearity with other exposures, it appears that this phytoestrogen led to a delay in the onset of breast development. And again, this was very similar to the findings that Cheng had uh, published with another phytoestrogen. And we already uh, alluded to the fact that the time of exposure may be critical, that at the newborn period, maybe it leads to earlier onset of pubertal maturation. So the phthalates. Everybody in this room is exposed to phthalates every single day. Every personal care product that you use that has the word fragrance on it is a low molecular weight phthalate. If you happen to ever put a plastic in your microwave, you're being exposed to both low molecular weight if you're using the clear plastic wrap on top and high molecular weight if you're using any kind of plastic container. If you give your kids a rubber ducky to teeth on, which most of it did, you're exposing them to high molecular weight phthalates. So we're all exposed to phthalates all the time. Um, there's several studies, including ours, that noted an increased BMI in waist circumference with exposure to phthalates and with increased insulin resistance. Uh, we found that there was an earlier onset of breast development with the, with the low molecular weight phthalates but when we then controlled for BMI, it appeared that the effect of these phthalates was mediated through an increase in the BMI. And there was no 
other, there was no independent effect of the satellites. Um, we also noted, uh, as did other groups, a later onset of pubic hair stage two with the high molecular weight phthalates. And that, um, taking a look at this curve, this is the overweight girls. Um, the effect is much more pronounced in the normal weight girls. Um, with this being the higher exposure, the lower exposure in the normal weight girls. The phenols, just as with the phthalates, these are ubiquitous compounds that we're all exposed to all the time. Um, the BPA has been pulled out of uh, infant formulas, bottles, but we're still using it as a resin and a polymer, and most metal cans, if you're buying your food, are still lined with the polymer made from BPA. Uh, sunscreen is Benzophenone 3, mothballs are one of the metabolites is 2,5-dichlorophenol. Hand sanitizers used to be made with triclosan, but toothpaste that say anti-gingivitis still contain triclosan in it. I already alluded to the phytoestrogens being polyphenols. And thermal paper, although for us as consumers, probably a relatively low exposure to BPA and its replacement BPS, but in those who work in banks, or work at cash registers, they have measurable levels of uh, BPA and, and or BPS. And please recall, before diethylstilbestrol was used as a pharmacologic estrogen, BPA was the pharmacologic estrogen that was used. So this is now looking at age at breast stage two, uh, looking at the lowest and highest uh, quintiles for the phenols, um, and you can see that those with the higher levels of phenols, have, of benzophenone 3, have a, a delay in onset of puberty, as with the phytoestrogen enterolactone. Uh, when we're taking a look now at this metabolite of mothballs, we see um, age at B2 again, and those with greater levels uh, going into puberty earlier, suggesting that 2,5-DCP uh, is acting uh, as perhaps an estrogenic compound, and triclosan, uh, this was significant, but barely, and again, a somewhat earlier onset of breast two. Uh, another group of compounds, as we're winding down here, um, are the persistent organohalogens. Uh, again, DDT and PCBs have been banned, but they're still used in other countries. Uh, we already heard about PCBs and thyroid dysfunction from Dr. Zeller. Um, and some have been fam uh, phased out very recently, the flame-retarding PBDEs. Um, the organochlorine pesticides are still used wisely, widely. Um, at the time I put this bullet in, I did not know that Dr. Eskenazi would be joining us, um, but you can see that uh, the neurodevelopmental effects of uh, some of the organochlorines. Uh, so when we looked at the organohalogens, uh, again, we're looking at uh, these longitudinal models. So we're looking at exposures at ages seven and eight, and then looking at the effect of um, uh, the organohalogens. Oops, sorry. Uh, I took that slide out to save some time. Uh, but again, uh, with the organohalogens, it appears that there was a delay somewhere between 6 and 11 months. And again, we're looking at these pure compounds. And again, there's collinearity with some of the other compounds. But we, we did combine all the PCBEs and PBDs together. Um, I wanted to uh, close with a couple of different thoughts. So with tomorrow's women, we know that there's epigenetic effects of some of these EDCs, and um, let's talk just for a moment about PCOS. Uh, BPA has been studied most closely in both Kandaraki uh, in 2011 and a paper that was published more recently by Aiken in 2015 uh, showed that in those women with P PCOS that they had higher levels of um, BPA. A study by Vega uh, reported that there were multiple EDCs that were found in women with PCOS, including the perfluorochemicals. Um, and here's something good that phthalates might do. Those who had higher levels of phthalates were found to be less likely to have PCOS. And a, world or a word or two about tomorrow's men. Um, I wanted just, even though our studies are on girls, I wanted to give a little bit shout out to the boys. So that uh, it's been hypothesized that uh, testicular germ cell cancer, cryptorganism, in some cases of hypospadias, and low sperm counts could be grouped together as something which Niels Kekbeck 
labeled the testicular dysgenesis syndrome, and he proposed that its origin was in fetal life. Uh, Richelieu reported that if the mother or the father had worked with pesticides, that there was an increased odds of hypospadias. And uh, this paper just got published last month. It's looking at trimester of phthalate exposures, diethylhexyl phthalate exposure. And uh, what, they what they noted was that in mothers who had higher levels of phthalates in the first trimester, that it led to a shorter anal genital distance in boys. And if the higher level was in the second trimester, that it led to a narrower penile width. So again, first trimester is, or is organogenesis. Second trimester is overall fetal growth. So we need to think about um, you know, the relative timing of puberty. Those who go into puberty earlier actually have a slower tempo as they go through puberty. And so puberty, a longer puberty, expands the window of susceptibility, particularly for breast cancer. The other thing is that it appears that some of this change in the onset of pubertal maturation may be related to an intensity of the exposure to some of these endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, and so what I would propose is that we need to think of both the size of the opening, the duration of puberty, and the severity of the storm. If it's a nice balmy Baltimore day and it's 75 degrees and it's not raining, you have your windows wide open. But like when I arrived on a Friday and Saturday when it's like 45 degrees and raining, you don't want your window open that much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kimberly Gray, who uh, will bring us back to the developmental origins of health and disease and what NIH is doing about this. Kimberly works at the NIEHS, and she has been involved also more recently with the ECHO program, Environmental Influences on uh, Children's Health Outcomes, and uh, hopefully some uh, interesting studies that will be able to get supported by that particular program. So, Kimberly. For those who are here, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me. Um, normally, Jerry Heindel is up here giving this talk, so we're going to give it from a different perspective from our institute. I'm Kimberly Gray, and I'm just going to disclose I'm an epidemiologist before I give this talk, so you don't try to get into the weeds on some of the epigenetics. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what we've been doing at NIEHS, some highlights that Frank and Tom have already covered. I'll zip through really quickly. And since we're being taped, I'm not going to talk about funding opportunities, but I'll give you a glimpse of where we're going in the next few years. <clears throat> and I have no, no financial relationship or conflicts to disclose. So why environment matters? Um, <clears throat> at NIHS, we have to talk about this all the time because we're one of the institutes that's not at uh, NIH Bethesda campus. We're in Research Triangle Park, um, actually due to politics from the 1960s, uh, along with EPA. And it matters because there's 13 million deaths that can be prevented every year by improving our environment. That environmental factors influence over 85 of the 102 non-communicable diseases in the WHO report. This has really elevated uh, the influence of environment and health. It's, it's gained interest from a lot of our stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> environmental factors account for at least two-thirds of cancer cases in the United States. And as my director likes to say, and this continues to say, is you can't change your genes, but you can change your environment. Uh, more importantly, our children are not as healthy as they should be. There's about one in six children in the U.S. have a developmental disability. This is a 17 percent increase over the past decade. We put a lot of our efforts in children's environmental health at NIHS, not only through the children's centers, but through our uh, funded program and focus program in autism. Uh, we know that 14 percent of our children under 18 have been diagnosed with asthma. NIHS has always supported a very strong asthma program and the effects of a particulate matter on health of these children who are vulnerable. And now 32 percent of the U.S. children and adolescents are overweight or obese in 2010. A lot more of our research is now looking at the interaction of these environmental exposures and the vulnerability of children who are overweight and obese. <clears throat> Nearly a half of our children in the U.S. are allergic to something. Now we're starting to take a kind of an early peek at what could be uh, the plausible explanation with environment immune and early development. I'm going to repeat this again. We all carry a body burden, as Tom told you earlier. Um, I have that we have 287 chemicals in our cord blood. Over 47 of these chemicals in every pregnant woman were tested. We have still in our breast milk PCBs and dioxins, even 
Even today, pesticides, mercury, flame retardant, P PFCs, this is just to name a few, of the people tested by our colleagues at CEN CDC and the National Center of Environmental Health, 93% have BPA, 50 to 97% based on um, age and um, ethnicity, have 50 to 97% phthalates. Um, we have the PFO is 91 to 99%. Those are what are in your, um, your nonstick pans. 100% of flame retardants. The triclosan still at 80%. PCB still at 100%. And these airborne par par polyaromatic hydrocarbons are measured in 100% of the population assessed. So why do we care? So at NIEHS, we look at specific windows of susceptibility. In recent years, we really focused a lot on organo our organ systems as they're developing and how these can lead to childhood, puberty, and even late effects in adult life. The key point here is really to focus on these windows of susceptibility and the knowledge that we've gained throughout all the stages of development, through prenatal, through childhood, and this is just repeating what I said. So <clears throat> uh, we, we kind of take a step back when Jerry Heindel really partnered with the DOHAD organization of Mark Hansen and really looked at the DOE the do had definition. And the original definition was the developmental origins of health and disease as a multidisciplinary field that examines how environmental factors, more, more to the same nutrition, acting during the phase of developmental plasticity interact with genotypic variation to change the capacity in organisms to cope with this environment later in life. The original focus was early and early childhood, so really in that early developmental and that perinatal phase when tissues are developing. Since then, um, there's a broader definition of DOHAD, which now includes environment, as well as <clears throat> looking at this really sensitive time window when organs are forming, when there's gene expression programs are being established. We've spent a lot of money at NIEHS really looking at this epigenetic reprogramming repro through our epigenetic roadmap program run by Lisa Chadwick in our office, through the basic science that we have through programs like uh, the transgenerational program as well as our target program, and really looking at changes that occur during these developmental that permanently alter the potential of an organ that's being done really in our basic science program. Again, more of a focus on why we're looking at the stages of prenatal and postnatal, and that the timing and route of exposure will determine both the nature <clears throat> and the severity of the effects. And these effects are sometimes subtle, and I, I think Tom gets to that point where it may not be a hormonal uh, body burden measure that goes down, but I think we consistently see this through our neurodevelopmental, where most of our data is pretty strong, that we see subtle effects that aren't readily um, recognized except in some of our cohorts that have repeated measures over time. And we also know that the same level of exposure during these different life stages may actually produce different effects. So not only do we have these multiple compounds, we have these multiple windows of exposure, and we also have uh, these different effects. So which of these children will get disease? Is it, is it perhaps already predetermined or is it latent? So we, we go back to the proof of principles of these human tragedies. Uh, at NIHS, we kind of always look at smoking during pregnancy as kind of our gold standard. If we see the same effect, then we can guarantee that that chemical is one of concern for us. Um, we have the Minamata Bay, mercury contamination, lead was removed from gasoline and paint, DES, a drug that was to prevent miscarriages, and then we have the transgener transgenerational effects of DES. PCBs, rice oil contamination in, in Japan, the PBB contamination here in the United States and Michigan on the livestock feed. We have seen multiple problems of thyroid deficiency and reproductive health in those generations, led by Emory now. And then arsenic in drinking water seems to still be a problem, and now arsenic in our food supply, and now back to lead again in drinking water. Um, <clears throat> and the story just keeps continuing. So at NIHS this year, it's our 50th year. So we've done a lot of systematic analysis of data, where we need to go. Are there some chemicals we call legacy chemicals, some we call emergency ke emerging chemicals. So what Jerry Heindel did is, um, and I participated in this, is we, we went with NTP's model of looking at a systematic review of DOHAD literature. We systematically looked at DOHAD publications with only epidemiology. And the only thing you have to look here is it, there's, there's just a rise in publications. I think I'll use this here. There's a rise in publications. And the publications, again, this is a specific DOHAD. This is the prenatal in utero effects, 
early perinatal on outcomes. And this is, the, this is the published literature in epidemiology. And we had a blip in the radar when the obesogen hypothesis came out. We had another blip in the radar when the first PP talks meeting by, to, to, um, for Philip Grandjean's work in the Ferris Island and the consistency of that meeting. And just the portfolio, this is not a portfolio, this is the, the literature itself has been pretty much increasing since that time. We have over 425 publications to go through. Of those publications, 50% of those publications were funded through efforts at NIHS and a lot of support from EPA as well. <clears throat> Don't spend a lot of time on this. We're going to have this in press pretty soon. But what I really wanted to focus on is these different colors here are the 425 publications by the compounds. So getting back to the earlier remark, there's a lot of compounds that we're exposed to. We're aware of that. We've categorized them by the class of compound. And then we looked at what the, the epidemiological support was. And again, the blue is the neurological outcomes, yellow is cancer, and the, the light orange is respiratory. So you can see there's a lot more data at which we expected in the neuro, neurological and cognitive development. The majority of this data is coming from our birth cohorts um, around the, the world, looking at the developmental window being uh, prenatal and right after a postnatal period. Um, metals, you see a lot. That those effects are continuous. And now we're really going to start drilling down into this data to really look at what cohorts are reporting what and over time, um, just to try to get a systematic review of where we need to go from here and what are some of the concerns we have and the marry this data with the, the uh, animal data. It's a lot of publications. So we have robust scientific evidence that's emerged over the 15 years demonstrating the prenatal exposure to these environmental chemicals are implicated in adverse reproductive and developmental health problems. And that was um, also an opinion of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists from 2013. Uh, we were very um, pleased that uh, um, they're one of, one of our um, passionate advocacy groups that really keep um, uh, the focus of environment on the forefront. Um, so from Aretha Newbold at NIHS, just to give you some background information on this, the developmental exposure to DES and weight gain, this was the proof of principle with uh, maternal smoking that we used, that if you looked at CD1 mice to, DE, to DES who at five days of birth resulted in increased weight gain starting really early at puberty in female mice, and there was no change in food or exercise. So that was pretty, pretty much the, the, the impetus, that and the, the prenatal smoking, where we really started, and NTP worked a lot on doing some systematic reviews on what other chemicals, environmental chemicals, could be related to weight gain. And I think we mentioned some earlier, Bruce Bloomberg, Bruce Bloomberg did some work on tributyl tin, which is really some of the strongest evidence. <clears throat> the proof or principle in the epidemiology world is the effect of maternal smoking during pregnancy on childhood weight. Um, you could see from the never smokers to smokers, the BMI over the 90th percentile increases with smoking during pregnancy, as well as um, for women who are, um, for children who are obese, as um, never smoked during pregnancy, smoked less than five cigarettes to uh, more than 10 cigarettes. You still see the effect of smoking. It doesn't go away. And this basically is a cross-sectional studies. You're seeing the, the relative risk, and here's the prospective studies, and here's the retrospective. Again, you're getting a lot of strong data in the prospective studies, which gains more strength. <clears throat> this study is done by Dana Delanoy. This is the look at prenatal lead exposure. Um, she's with the uh, Michigan Children's Study and one of our outstanding new investigators. Dana has spent a lot of time looking at epi epigenetics when she was at Duke and now at uh, Michigan. She's spending a lot of time looking at um, the models from the human models and replicating in the animals. So what she did here is she pre-treated the the dams prior to mating with lead and looked at their offspring. And long story short is if you see here that um, the body measurements of the, of the pups after birth increased by the amount of um, prenatal lead that they were exposed to and that there's a sex specific um, effect which you can't see on this application. Um, again, pr uh, we have a lot of data in the prenatal pesticide exposure. 
Um, a lot of our cohorts measure OPs differently, but consistently across three cohorts, just released in 2011, our children's centers with Brenda Eskenazi taking the lead, looked at prenatal exposures and IQ in seven-year-olds and was replicated in three different populations, both at HERS and the agricultural health, agricultural community, as well as the urban community here with Ginny Rall and Mary Wolf in um, Mount Sinai. And then here's something interesting that's coming up 2012 and 2014 from the Ferris Island. I told you that's where we started PP Talks in 2007. What uh, Philippe has been able to look at is he has a captive audience in the um, Ferris Island, and he was able to look at the um, effects of early exposure to PCBs and PFOs and how it affected the children's response to vaccination, both at a booster shot at five and then again at seven. And repeatedly with PFOs and PCBs, he saw a change, a decrease in the booster by minus 11.9% and 23.8. And it was repeated for diphtheria as well. Um, uh, we, we've worked with CDC to take a look at this, and now we're going to look at see if there's some health implications here showing that it's plausible <coughs> that these, in, these are not in utero, but their early um, environmental exposures may actually have immune suppression leading to um, a problem with vaccine efficacy. So here's where a lot of our money has been spent at NIHS and EPA looking at the problems of air pollution. I've never really thought of air pollution as an endocrine disruptor, but now I'm I'm, I'm open to this. Uh, Jerry claims everything is being an endocrine disruptor, but we've been doing a lot of work in the uh, globally looking at mortality, cardiovascular disease, asthma, allergies, and now we're seeing a role of air pollution and anxiety and neurodevelopment, and plausibly obesity and type 2 diabetes. And I'm going to share just a few slides on some of that that early data. This coming from the Columbia Children's Centers, who really um, started their children's centers to look at prenatal exposures to PAHs. Um, and they looked at the children at five and seven, and you can see that they're associated with higher the PAH level, and this was measured um, at third trimester. <coughs> you see an increase in the BMI score. This is at age five, and it was repeated again at age seven. And it'll be interesting to see if Andrew repeats this at nine and 12, and if the trend still exists, and if this trend changes by gender. <clears throat> Within the same cohort, Brad Peterson has been doing some MRI studies on a subselect group of children within the, um, the cohort. What he did here is he took about 40 children, those who were highly exposed to PAHs and those who had no exposure to PAHs, which is kind of hard to find, and he ran them through diffusion tensor imaging. And really, basically, what you're seeing here is there was reduced matter was associated with def deficits in information processing and severe externalizing problems in those children. You see more on the left hemisphere. This is the prenatal, but he actually saw some changes in the uh, frontal and dorsal when he looked at postnatal changes in these children as well. So this is new data that's coming out of uh, that children's center. They're going to be repeating this in a larger cohort, and there are other cohorts at Cincinnati um, that will be replicating this data as well. <clears throat> So what do I have to say about exposure across a lifespan? We know prenatal. We've talked about childhood. We'd, we've seen some information on the effects of environmental co chemicals on adolescence and puberty. We're interested to learn about reproductive years. We haven't spent a lot of time looking at the health of the mother after she delivers her child. And there's some data, especially from the gestational diabetes, that's showing us that maybe we should spend a little time looking at the pregnant mom and the health of the mom postnatally uh, to see the influence of environmental exposures during those critical windows, preconception as well as during her pregnancy and how it may impact her health. We also have a lot of interest in looking at the preconception period and transgenerational effects. And preconception not only being the uh, a window of rapid changing, but we have cell growth, mitotic division, and again, those hormonal changes, and of course, epigenetic changes. Can exposures during germ cell development in the mom or the dad affect the offspring? That's where we're going next. So we have some data showing that preconception smoking during pregnancy is linked with later diabetes in children. This is coming from Lamerrill, again, one of our um, outstanding new investigator investigators at NIHS um, working with Barbara Cohen. And what they're showing here um, is where neither parent smoked or both parents smoked, you can see that the um, age of diabetes <clears throat> was earlier if 
only your father or both, I'm sorry, only, only mother or both parents smoked, seeming to suggest this, um, this being a, a, a new and not exciting window of opportunity, but a window that we should really be considering. Um, as Linda likes to say, don't forget the dads. She repeatedly tells me that, what's going on with the fathers, who has the assessments of the dads. We know from the drug use um, literature that cocaine exposure to adult males influences the anxiety and behaviors of their offspring. There's similar developmental abnormalities seen in offspring that use alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco. Dad stress experiences effects of offspring stress and metabolism. And then we have the literature of offspring of adult males fed a low protein diet showed impaired liver function, that offsprings to dads fed a high fat diet, have diabetes and poor semen quality, and paternal obesity results in offspring obesity. And also there's some literature to suggest that there may be an increased rate of autism. Another factor is looking at transgenerational inheritance. We have a trans tra transgenerational program. Um, Lisa Chadwick directs that program. Um, initially, we've uh, suggested in the animal model that we see a positive effect with the following chemicals. Um, and this is in the absence of nutritional deprivation. So now we're really looking at these transgenerational effects, or I should say intergenerational effects in our human population kind of hard to get out to those F3s in the human population and costly. So where are we? So we have robust data, and I showed you that through our literature review, that the prenatal time period is critical and it's important for the windows of susceptibility to environmental chemicals. Childhood is a sensitive window, but we now have emerging data that implicates the preconception as a sensitive window in both males and females. Our preliminary data suggests that pregnancy is a sensitive window for future health of the mother. But as noted earlier, we have limited data on the interactions of those windows between a life, within the lifespan. We're not clear what makes a window. And again, we're doing one compound at a time or classic compounds, and hopefully we'll get a little bit better at that. Our bottom line is exposure to environmental chemicals at sensitive times can lead to a sensitivity or susceptibility to disease and dysfunction throughout the life and potentially cross generations and that we're gonna improve our knowledge of sensitive windows and how they can, can lead to improved prevention of disease and dysfunction by reducing exposures. Just wanna leave you here with uh, Hansen and Gluckman's um, intervention and disease outcome. You don't see much, your fixed, gen, your fixed contribution to risk is small for genetics. And as you can see over time that the impact of um, an adult intervention is small and this is the critical period for us to divide timely intervention um, to produce the substantial risk in the reduction of chronic disease. I know it's a bigger burden on the pediatricians, but it's just something to think about. Um, we've done some efforts at NIHS to show that improved air quality was associated with better lung function in children. This was released uh, last year from the Children's Health Study, that the decline in air pollutants in Southern California was associated with improved lung function. That was a New England Journal of Medicine. JAMA, they just published two weeks ago, um, looking at asthmatic and non-asthmatics and improvement in bronchitis. So the, the good story is if you reduce the exposure, you can improve health of the children. In China, in the e-waste area, we can show that nutrition can combat lead exposure in children. Uh, educating the parents was critical here to lower these lead levels in the kids, and those that were most successful with a 15% lower lead levels were those children whose parents and grandparents really had a high education and really knew the importance of eating a good breakfast. So we're really focusing on translating this program that she developed uh, to become an integral part of the lead prevention program. Hopkins has looked at this interaction between weight, asthma health, and indoor pollution. This is just one of their quick studies to look at the relationship between BMI and cough with PM. So as PM increases, obesity is high, you see a probability of cough is high. So what they're working on is a weight loss intervention that may help reduce the asthma symptoms and morbidity and mortality associated with asthma in that area. So educate yourself and others on the major exposures of concern for that community and that person. Ask parents about their exposures, encourage a healthy diet, healthy weight, and stress management, and counsel parents to avoid relevant environmental exposures to their lifestyle. Our final speaker is Brenda uh, Eskenazi, who is, uh, directs the Center for Environmental Research and Child Health, CERC, at the University of California, Berkeley. She has uh, uh, training that includes initially psychology, but then she became 
uh, a neuropsychologist, then she became, uh, her postdoc training was in epidemiology and environmental toxicology, which probably explains everything, ultimately. But she currently directs a program that she's going to talk about today, which is uh, Chimico's, uh, which relates to uh, health effects of pesticides and farm workers in, uh, uh, in California. And we look forward to her talk. I want to thank the organizers. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the health and neurodevelopment of a study that we've been working on for the last 17 years, the Tremaco study. So our study takes place in the Salinas Valley, which is the salad bowl of the nation. Most of the salad that we eat, even here on the East Coast, comes from this place in California. TRIMACOS is an acronym. It stands for the Center for Health Assessment of Mothers and Children of Salinas. And TRIMACOS also means kids in Mexican Spanish. We are a longitudinal birth cohort study that began in 1999-2000 with funding from NIHS and EPA, one of the children's centers. We enrolled 600 pregnant women from clinics serving farm workers. Almost all the women were Spanish speaking, almost all the women were born in Mexico. About half of them had been in the United States for less than five years, which means that, although we didn't ask, probably half of them were undocumented. Almost all lived within poverty um, and were, did not have high education. And about half of them worked in agriculture during their pregnancy. And even if they themselves did not work in agriculture, they lived with farm workers. Chimacos is a longitudinal birth cohort study, like I said. We followed the children during pregnancy, the mothers during pregnancy, and the children when they were born at six months, one year, two year, three and a half year, five year, seven year, nine year. And because Frank Bureau told us we followed them every nine months, we couldn't do every six months, uh, from nine year to 12 and three quarters years. And now they're 14 years old. They just, we just finished the 14-year-old assessment, and now we're just about to start the 16-year-old's assessment. Um, when the children were nine, we also enrolled a second cohort of nine-year-olds that also came from the valley. We've measured about 100 different chemicals. We have the potential to measure many more. We have about 150,000 stored samples in lots of freezers. Today, I'm only going to be talking about one of those classes of chemicals, organophosphate pesticides. So as everyone here knows, organophosphates affect the nervous system of both insects and humans by depressing acetylcholinesterase, resulting in overexcitation of the, of the central nervous system. But we're learning that there are lots of other mechanisms. Uh, Ted Slot Slotkin has showed us that even low dose exposure may affect things like sodium channels. So it's not surprising that organophosphates at high doses would affect nervous system functioning. The question is, what about chronic low dose exposure? So on the left is a picture of the Salinas Valley, and we are fortunate in California that we have something called the pesticide use reporting data, which I'll come back to in a little while. But the little dots that you see there represent the homes of the women during pregnancy. And so we're able to map where they live relative to where chemicals are being used in agriculture. About 500,000 pounds of organophosphates were used during the pregnancies of these women in their community. We took urine samples at 13 and 26 weeks gestation, and we measured something called dialkyl phosphate metabolites, which are nonspecific metabolites of organophosphates. We can't look at acetylcholinesterase because we don't have a baseline on these women before pregnancy, and also because we don't believe that the levels of exposure that they're exposed to are going to really significantly depress acetylcholinesterase. So we had to find a, a, a marker that would be more sensitive to low-dose exposure, and this is what CDC had developed, was the DAPS. So if you look on the left, you can see in blue the Chimacos women during pregnancy, and in red, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is a general US population. And I selected women of reproductive age. And you can see that the levels of 
prenatal exposures to the Tremacos women were significantly higher than in the NHANES. And uh, similarly, the children of Tremacos, there's a five-year-old children, compared to the NHANES children, are also significantly higher. So what have we found over the years? We have found that these DAPs, the dialkyl phosphate metabolites, or OP pesticide metabolites during pregnancy, were associated with shortened gestation, abnormal neonatal reflexes on the Brazelton, decreased mental development in toddlers on the Bailey, poor verbal abilities in preschool, pervasive developmental disorders, attention problems in school age, and about a few years ago, we also showed, which Kimberly showed a few minutes ago, that OP metabolite levels were also related to the children's IQ at seven years. So what you have in front of you is a graph that is in tertiles of mother's prenatal levels divided into low, medium, and high. And if you compare the levels of the children of the women who had high metabolites versus the women, children of the women with low metabolites, you see about a seven IQ point difference. If you look at it by the different domains on the WISC IQ, which is uh, the full scale IQ is on the right, and then it's divided into working memory, processing speed, verbal comprehension, and perceptual reasoning, and the zero is the no effect line, you see that there's statistically significant decreases related to the DAPs in all measures of IQ. So to put this in a different way, with each tenfold increase in the mother's DAP levels during pregnancy, we see on average between a five and a six point decrease in IQ. What this means, and this is from an old study that was done in 1988 by Bernie Weiss, that if you look at the normal distribution of the US population, and these are numbers from the US population in 1988, you have about six million children who are, uh, that's, this is not politically correct anymore, but mentally retarded. And if you were to shift the IQ in a population by something similar to what we're seeing with the OP metabolites, by about five to six IQ points, you'll see an additional about 50% more children who are falling into that range which means a lot more children who are going to need special services. Another way of looking at it is Dave Bellinger in 2012 said, if you look at preterm birth, about 34,000 IQ points are lost due to preterm birth. But if you look at organophosphate pesticides, and this is from our paper and Stephanie Engel's paper, you see about half of that, about 16 million IQ points lost in the United States. More recently, we have just, and this is unpublished, we have found relationships at nine and 12 years of age with executive functioning. And this is very important because executive functioning sets up what these kids do in terms of risk-taking behavior later on. And that's exactly what we're interested in and I'm going to get back to in a few minutes. So I just want to shoot myself in the foot right off. DAPs are not a perfect measure of exposure. It's a very imperfect measure. It's the best that we've got. It's the gold standard for looking at organophosphates. If you want to look at organochlorines like DDT, we have a great measure. We can measure it in blood. But for organophosphates, we're stuck with these DAPs. And they are very short-lived in the human body. The exposure to OPs is very short-lived in the human body. These DAPs are not pesticide specific, so the amount that we're detecting in the urine may have uh, be, be related to exposure to very toxic pesticides or less toxic pesticides, we don't know, so it's not toxicity weighted, and it doesn't identify the source of exposure. So more recently, we've begun to look at that pesticide use reporting data, which I spoke about earlier, that we're very fortunate to California to have. It was mandated in 1990, and it provides the uh, following, the pesticide active ingredients, where they've been applied, when they've been applied to a square mile section, and the crop that was treated. And so we can look at where somebody was during their pregnancy, where they lived, and what they were exposed to in their immediate vicinity. 
we have also then taken, let's say, for example, different buffers around that person's house. We've imposed wind direction, and we've also done some more sophisticated modeling so we can model what exposure may have been by living in that residence. So on the left is actually what I showed you earlier, except now instead of for every tenfold increase in dApps, looking at the IQ point change, we're actually looking at the change in IQ per standard deviation increase in DAPs. So just, it's going to show the same results, just a different metric. And you can see that, again, just as I showed you earlier, the full-scale IQ, verbal comprehension, they're all actually all statistically significant, that there's an error in the processing speed. Now, if we look at the PUR data, just the PUR data, relationship to the same metric, the IQ at seven years of age, we still see a relationship with PUR data and full-scale IQ and verbal comprehension significantly in decreased uh, of both of these. And this is adjusting for the DAPs. So this is the PUR data in relationship to IQ adjusting for the maternal DAPs. We believe that the DAPs reflect dietary increase, dietary exposure, whereas the PUR data reflects environmental exposure, like in air and in dust. We then said, okay, what we can't do with DAPs, maybe we can do with PUR data. So we looked at all of the different OPs, the most important OPs that have been used in this community, and we can look at the relative toxicity of these pesticides, these OP pesticides, on the brain because we have animal studies that show us the relative toxicity in relationship to acetylcholinesterase inhibition. And so you can see on this relative potency, the most potent of all of these pesticides is oxydemiton methyl. So then we did a model of the PUR data in relationship to the seven-year IQ, and just and these are separate models, so each are separate statistical models, you see that they line up exactly to the relative potency factors. Mm -hmm. So that oxydemiton methyl, which was the most potent, is the one that's most related to the seven-year IQ. And these are controlling for all those other covariates, including the maternal DAPs. So if we look at the agricultural use of neurotoxic pesticides in the Salinas Valley, apart from organophosphates, and this goes to, I think it was George that asked the question earlier about mixtures, not all of these pesticides, classes of pesticides, carbamates, manganese-containing fungicides, pyrethroids, neonicotinoids, they don't all act similarly on the brain and on the nervous system. So how do you look at them together as a mixture? One thing we decided to do was, what if we looked at each one of them separately? And you can see that the OPs and the fungicides and the pyrethroids and the neonicotinoids, this is using the PUR data, are all related to decrease in IQ. The carbamates are not. But these are very highly correlated, so you really can't look at them in the same model together because they're very highly correlated. So we said, can we combine agricultural use of neurotoxic pesticides? Well, we said, what if you live in a square mile that gets a lot of pesticide exposure? So we rank ordered where people lived. And what we showed is that most of the exposure, most of the relationship with seven-year IQ, uh, and we put them all together, and we came up with a, an algorithm that allowed us to look at all of them together. And what you see is on the right-hand side, uh, a principal components analysis that combines all of these pesticides together. And what it looks very similar to is what you're seeing in the OPs, but it takes into account the manganese-containing fungicides as well as the, py the, the pyrethroids. 
So we have to consider the mixture of neurotoxic chemicals children are exposed to. It's not easy at this point in time. We can do it statistically. We're trying to do it toxicologically. But we also need to consider all the other factors that affect neurodevelopment. And these are just some of them that we've collected data on. One of the most important things are genetics. And I was going to ask Tom about that earlier. Um, so we've looked at something called the PON1 gene. And the PON1 gene is related to the detoxification of organophosphates. And we measured enzyme activity in the bloods of the mothers and of their children. And if you look at the PON1 genotype, you can see that if you're unfortunate and have the QQ genotype, you're going to be less able to detoxify the organophosphates. We also found that if you were very young, like six months of age, compared to a seven-year-old, you also had much level, lower levels of the uh, enzyme to, do, to detoxify organophosphates. So if you happen to be a six-month-old with the wrong genotype of your mother, you were really not going to be in great shape in terms of OP exposure. So therefore, people, different people are, are, are differently susceptible especially young children. So now that very same result I showed you earlier, let's look at the full-scale IQ. I'm now going to look at this modified by the mother's genotype and specifically her enzyme activity during pregnancy. So I'm going to look again at the change in WISC full-scale IQ for a tenfold increase in the mother's DAPs during the pregnancy. And if the mother had low levels of DAPs, low levels of, sorry, of, of PON1 enzyme, that means she's going to be less able to detoxify the organophosphates. And in those children, we see for each tenfold increase, on average, a 10-point decrease in IQ. If the mother had a moderate level of prenatal enzyme to PON, there was about a five-point decrease. But if she was very fortunate and had very high enzyme levels, we saw no relationship at all with prenatal exposure to, um, to DAPs, to the OPs. So we see a relationship, an effect modification by genetic makeup. So what are the lifetime consequences of early life exposure? to environmental neurotoxicant. Kimberly talked about the fact that we really want to be looking further out, and our children are only going to be 16 now. But we're, what really we're interested in, what happens to them as citizens of the world? There have been very, very few studies that have looked at environmental chemicals and juvenile delinquency. A bunch of studies on lead, one single study on tobacco smoke, and one study on air quality. In Salinas, a little bit about Salinas Valley, 75% Latino, mostly Mexican, 31% of our community lives below the poverty level. There are two and a half times the homicide rates in the general U.S. population, and only 10% and 10 of the high school students report being in gangs. That's report being in gangs. So we believe that a much larger percentage of the children are in gangs. In fact, Salinas is one of six high-risk communities nationally for youth gang violence, right behind Inglewood in, in, in uh, Los Angeles and Detroit. The children have grown up with lots of adversity. This is just some of the adversity at the, at the one-year mark. Um, very, very dense housing, lots of food insecurity, no stimulation, maternal depression for good reason in this community. And so what happens when they're exposed to these kinds of adversities living in the community that they're living in? So if you combine the neurotoxic exposome, the pesticides in this case, and you add psychosocial stress, and you add the genes that I was talking about, where does that put the children when they reach adulthood? It's not just a double jeopardy, it's a triple jeopardy. So we've just begun to look at this. Now this is again looking at the seven-year IQ. 
This is a paper that has recently been submitted. And if you look at, in purple, which is the steeper slope line, those children of mothers who had higher adversity during the children's life, whether that's food insecurity or having someone in their family killed or deportation or whatever you can think of, you can see that those children had a much steeper slope in terms of the, the relationship of the DAPs during the mother's pregnancy and the child's IQ. Again, an interaction between early life adversity and the OP exposure. Different types of adversity seem to affect boys and girls differently. Maybe it has to do with stage of puberty that they're in, but we haven't looked at that yet. And so if you look at boys, it seems to be that learning environment, that's the adversity. If you don't give the boys stimulation, they're going to be most affected by their mother's exposure in utero to the OPs. If you look at girls, it has to do with their sensitivity to their mother's adversity. So that the girls, if I could uh, minimalize this, the girls are more sensitive to what's going on in the home, whereas the boys are more sensitive to their learning environment and being stimulated. Not that girls shouldn't be stimulated. We have also begun to look at not just what's in the home, but what's in the community. So here is a slide looking at not seven-year IQ, but 10 and a half-year IQ. And here we're looking at um, quartiles, looking at the PUR data. So these are quartiles of, of OP and carbamate exposure. This is the fourth quartile, meaning it's the highest exposure. And you can see here at 10 and a half that the mother's nearby residence during pregnancy, if she was in the very highest quartile, was, was resulted for, with a, a three-point IQ difference in her child at 10, 10 and a half. But there was also a relationship with household poverty and also with the neighborhood poverty. Now remember, this is an impoverished community, so it's a relatively homogeneous community, and still we're seeing a relationship of pesticide exposure, household poverty, and neighborhood poverty. And if you add all of these up, if you happen to be in an impoverished household, in a neighborhood that's impoverished, and in, with high exposure around you, you would have about close to a 10-point decrease in IQ. But I don't want to leave you with the notion that prenatal exposure is the only thing important. For neurodevelopment, we are not seeing a relationship between postnatal exposure and neurodevelopment, only prenatal exposure. However, when we look at lung function, the picture is very different. So here is a, a paper that's just recently come out in thorax and you can see that we're seeing no relationship of the mother's prenatal DAPs and lung function using spirometry at the, of the children at seven years of age. On this slide, we're looking at postnatal DAPs, meaning the child's level of exposure from zero to age five. So it's not an acute effect, it's a more chronic effect during early childhood and we see decreases in all measures of lung function at age seven. So this is the kind of picture that drives me crazy. <laughs> this is a picture of um, spraying of pesticides in Brazil because of Zika. And I'm not saying that pesticides should not be sprayed in Brazil, but there's no reason why we have a man in a hazmat suit behind a woman with a child, um, just feet away without some other kind of protection. Um, and this is the kind of thing that I think is going to be related to maybe a different kind of epidemic in the future. There is change ahead, and that's the good news. In California, we are seeing an increase in certified organic cropland. It is going up. The more you buy, the more we produce. Consequently, we are seeing a huge change. The red is organophosphates, 
a huge decrease over the time that we've done the study in the use of organophosphates. We have a very progressive agricultural commissioner in Monterey County, and we've seen a huge decrease in California overall. But we've also seen a six-fold increase in the last de decade in neonicotinoids, and this is probably an underestimate. Neonicotinoids is what's been implicated for the bee colony collapse. And neonicotinoids are coded on many of the seeds, and this would not be reflected in pesticide use reporting data because the seeds are coded in a different state, in a different location, and so we really don't know what human exposure is. In fact, we don't even have a way of measuring human exposure. But we are coming up with something that we're going to do next, which is this very summer, we are doing something that um, we, we hope works out well, we are actually taking 10 of the Chamacos children, the actual Chamacos children who are turning 16, and we are making them the researchers. And they are researching the, the relationship of pesticides in their community on 100 girls that are also the Chamacas in the Chamacos study. So we are going to be working with 10 youth and on 100 other youth. And we're giving them Kim Anderson's um, Oregon State bracelets, where we'll be able to pick up the neonicotinoids as well as all, a lot of other pesticides in the community. We're giving the children a GPS me a little device to add to their cell phones. And we're then going to look at where the children have walked in that week, where they've been in that week, relative to, to the pesticide use reporting data. And then we're going to use all of this to educate the community ab about how to use for themselves the pesticide use reporting data with the state health department. So that this measure, the pesticide use reporting data, is available to anybody. You can go online in California, put in your address, and find out what pesticides have been used nearby. And so now we're going to educate the Salinas Valley in how to use that. So with that, I'd like to thank all of the people that have worked on this study, in particular our field staff. I'd like to thank our funders. I'd like to thank our families. This is a 12-year-old with her little t-shirt that we gave her, and her mother, who is a house cleaner who only now uses green products. And we'd like to thank you. And that's our website, search.org. Thank you. <laughs>